Hi, Bill. Hey, Bob. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm very well. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright of Blogging Heads TV. You are William Broad is the, is the version of your name that will be familiar to pretty much everyone, I think, from all your, uh, all your science and technology coverage for the New York Times over, over the years. Right. Um, you've also written a number of books, including The Science of Yoga. Yay, Science of Yoga. Recently published, which I, and I, which I recently saw in the New York Times bestseller list. And you know, it has this cool tactile thing going on the jacket, which I would Absolutely. point out is not available on the Kindle edition. No. Which is two dimensions at most, I would say. Right, right. And we were thinking about adding scratch and sniff, but that costs too much. So. Really? Yeah. Uh, my publishers always spring for scratch and sniff. So yeah, uh, everybody should have it, I think. Yeah, it's always worked for me in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, uh, this is great. You're going to get to the, the, the bottom of what we really do and don't know about the benefits and even risks of yoga. And the benefits, uh, I guess, potentially range from... Uh, realms like creativity to uh, realms like sex. Absolutely. Just the things that science can address, right? As you know better than most people, science doesn't do everything. But it does shed a bright light on thousands of different claims that yoga has made over the millennia. And there are a lot of them. There um, are a lot of them. But, you know, before we talk about the, the science stuff, the stuff you, you, you focus on in your book, I want to ask a little about you, because you have been a practitioner of yoga for, we're talking like maybe four decades or something, right? Way too long, yeah, 42 years or something like that. Um, I started in freshman year of college. Uh, my friends were all into it. I tried it. I loved it. It made me feel better in body and mind. It helped me do stress management. It helped me unplug, unwind, just all the kind of cliches. You know, people say, yoga makes me feel good, and I do it, and uh, it became a close friend. I did it this morning. I'll do it tomorrow morning. Uh, it's part of my life. And you feel good like immediately after it? There, there, there's immediate reinforcement? There is, I'd say, immediate and long term. It just helps me navigate the day better. I'm also a gym rat. You know, it's the same, you know, you get the endorphin rush and you feel, you know, kind of centered after you work out. I find the same kind of uh, short and long term benefits from yoga. It just gets me in the right place, and it helps me concentrate. Um, I have a kind of cliche that, you know, it doesn't take time. It makes time. Mm. It real, I find that it just helps me be a better professional and a better father and a better spouse and all these things. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Buy my, buy my miracle pill. <laughs> Sign me up. I don't know. I think it's too late for me. But, but uh... ever, ever too late. Just, you know, think of... Well, well, we'll talk about lots of stuff. But for seniors, you know, what, is it, what does it mean to get old? Well, you get stiff and you lose your balance and you lose some of your mental acuity. Yoga addresses all those things. Now, are you, Just, wait, wait a second. Is this pitch directed specifically at me, the pitch to yes, seniors? Yes, absolutely. I'm looking I mean, at you here and thinking, geez, this guy really um, <laughs> needs a little help. Uh, okay, uh, well. I'm buy, not, my, I'm buy, not, buy my miracle I'm, cure. I'm not sure you're getting off on the right foot in this, in this interview, Bill. <laughs> But God knows. In fact, I woke up this morning and thought, you know, waking up, standing up in the morning isn't getting easier. No. Um, so oh, that, that, you know, the vertical, uh, the vertical position is really challenging. Right. It's a, it's a yoga asana. They call it the, the mountain pose. Uh -huh. You stand there very vertical and just take it all in for a while. So, yeah, so what is the difference between, like, yoga and just exercise? I mean, the way I think of it is, well, exercise is kind of more vigorous, and most forms of yoga, at least, are yes. not so much. And I, and I just think stretching. When I think yoga, I think stretching. Is, is that indeed? That's a lot of it. Yeah. That's a lot of it. It's very, um, in its older forms, there's sort of a blurring that's going on. Contemporary yoga can get very fast and tries to be aerobic. But usually, Yoga is not aerobic. It doesn't do the cardio. It doesn't get your heart pounding so fast. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of the book. They, there have been a number of scientific studies now that have shown that it doesn't get you into that, that the cardio zone, which is the, the sort of golden place that public health officials want you to get on a regular basis. Um, it, it's very different, really, from regular sports in this stretching thing. Also, in, in its older forms, uh, in this sort of centering and turning your focus inward. You're, 
a lot of yoga is to try to draw you in, to make you concentrate on your body and the and inner things rather than outer things, which is what uh, a lot of exercise does. So it really, it, it's a whole different paradigm, if you will. It uh, tends to be more gentle, tends to be inward rather than outward. You're right, it's a lot of, a lot of it is stretching. Um, but there are a lot of other things that go on. The breathing, regulated breathing, which turns out to be surprisingly powerful, not for the reasons that most yogis think, but it really works and does interesting stuff physiologically. Okay, just quickly on the inner outer thing. I mean, this uh, I've kind of wondered about this. I mean, I've I've uh, there is on the one hand a kind of spiritual aura surrounding yoga. I guess having to do partly with its historical origins. I think right. way back in time, it may have been more closely associated with meditation mm -hmm. than it is now. I mean, to the extent that we can discern it's, it's... But there, but right, but there is still this, and this is one thing I did not appreciate when I, uh, when the book came out, because I a lot of people are still wedded to it. There is this whole mystique of perfection. Yoga is perfect. Big, Big yogis are saintly in some kind of way that's beyond us. And the fact that the book brings up some, you know, potential dangers and shortcomings has been, uh, you know, has, has prompted a tidal wave of criticism. And I think some of that goes to this, that sort of residue of perfection that, that hangs around yoga because of its spiritual roots. Hmm. Okay. And, 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 and that is still kind of there. I mean, I sometimes think, yes. think that, that kind of, you know, people who do yoga are kind of getting away with, with these kind of <laughs> getting the spiritual credentials without doing the work. I mean, <laughs> hey, you know, you put, you, <laughs> nicely put, you know, you touch a yoga mat and somehow you're elevated. Right. right? There is this, this whole association, you know, I'm, I'm putting my foot on this path and it's, uh, it's leading up the mountain to the right place. So... There is a lot of that uh, anticipatory sort of um, purification that's going on or anticipatory, you know, uh, attempt to achieve some kind of physical, mental, spiritual perfection. Um, but, you know, it does come down. And there's also a lot of hard work. People <laughs> go to these classes and they work like crazy. I mean, I couldn't believe I did a class in Manhattan with this guy, uh, Glenn Black, who is just a talented, talented teacher. And... Man, I got out of that, and it took about four or five days to 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 recover and to get my equilibrium back. It was so intense. So there's a there's a huge spectrum. There's a fundamental misleading thing, and it's even in the title of the book, right? The science of yoga. Well, the the complicated truth is that there is no one yoga. There's lots of yogas. There's hundreds or maybe thousands of them. So you know, for science to grapple with this, for individuals to make generalizations, for authors, pushy authors, to sit there and say, this is what yoga is, this is what it isn't, this is what it can do, this is good and bad. It's, it's, it's dicey stuff in sometimes. Mm -hmm. So but, there, you can find speeded up yoga, you can find slowed down yoga, you can find laughter yoga, which really has nothing to do with yoga, but it, a lot of people do it, and it's very funny. There's so. actually something called laughter yoga? It's huge. It's a big, global, interesting trend. I did laughter yoga with the founder of it in Bombay. Went out to a park with all his friends. It was right during the monsoon season. On the cab ride there, the cab flooded. I had to ditch the cab uh, and get in a, a motor scooter, you know, delivery vehicle. So I finally got there. We did laughter yoga with all his friends. You know, huge tragedy in Bombay. People are drowning and dying. Buildings are shorting out. And we had the greatest time. We just laughed and laughed. And, uh, you know, there was some breathing and stretching, but it was mostly just doing things like, okay, we're going to do the, um, you know, the, the outraged credit card bill pose. <laughs> you know, and totally silly thing. So but that's laughter fun. yoga. It's, uh, it was a lot of fun. Is that a totally new thing? It's hard to imagine that happening 2,000 years ago in India. It's a totally new thing. He invented it, and uh, it 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 goes a lot. There are a lot of laughter yoga groups in India. Mm -hmm. There are a lot around the world. There are some in New York City. Okay. <laughs> now back to more conventional forms of yoga. So, 
let's let's uh, let's start with moods. I guess one question is um, maybe this is related to the spirituality question, but uh, one claim would be, well, it makes you feel better afterwards, which you could say about a lot of forms of exercise. Right. Another claim would be it changes your 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 nature in a more ongoing way. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, you're you more optimistic or, or more empathetic or whatever throughout the day. Right. Uh, and, uh, as opposed to, you know, getting a little boost that then subsides. Mm -hmm. um, are you willing to make either of those claims for yoga? A science, I'm a science journalist, and in, in this book I've tried to just stick with the science. Mm -hmm. The science shows, you know, maybe let's just step back for a second. Who does yoga science? Well... Big Pharma doesn't. They have absolutely no product interest in this. The feds don't do a lot of yoga research. They're starting to look into it a little bit. The yoga research that exists tends to be spotty, mm -hmm. tends to be ununiform, tends to be done mostly by people who are hobbyists. They have a personal interest in yoga. They've pursued this over the year, years. A lot of Indian scientists have done interesting studies. But so getting back to moods, there's been no really good long-term studies. What you find is little narrow slices. The slices are fascinating. Mm -hmm. For instance, there's a group of scientists in Cambridge, Massachusetts, at Harvard and Boston University. They looked at a variety of yoga practitioners uh, doing many different kinds of forms, and they discovered that uniformly these people tended to raise their levels of GABA. GABA is a central neurotransmitter in mood control. It acts as an antidepressant. You know, yoga did it, and they, ha they published two beautiful studies on this. You, people kind of feel this, and they talk about it, but in this case, uh, science went in there and could illuminate and say, no doubt about it, this is happening. Now, these, now, these levels this, were elevated in an ongoing way or immediately after practice? or it, it, You know, I'd have to go back and look at the study, but I'm willing to bet that it was after practice and that there wasn't a, a long-term follow-up. So I, I would say that it, there you know, isn't that kind of empirical database that says you know, it goes this long, the effect it lasts this long, and you compare it with endorphins and jogging at the gym. Especially there's very little comparative data from sports and yoga, uh, except in certain narrow cases, like when when yoga teachers say, oh, yoga is the only thing you need to do. You get, you know, that cardio rush and you get the aerobic uh, stuff that all the public health officials say you need. Well, that's a big claim. Big claims require big evidence. Scientists get skeptical. They go in, they look at it, and they say, no, you actually don't get all that stuff. So that's a case where there has been those kind of sweeping comparative studies between sports and yoga. But that tends to be the exception. Okay. Um, and what about uh, the, the realm of creativity? Um, I love it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would think that that's particularly hard to gauge. So before we even get into any attempts to do that, right. what, what about your own experience? My own experience is that when I do my routine, I keep a uh, pencil and paper or pen nearby and jot things down. I tend to uh, think quite creatively in some kind of mysterious subconscious way. So thoughts pop up, they bubble up. Same way, you know, after you've gone to sleep with a problem and you wake up in the morning and suddenly, you know, the, you know, the story has a new structure or you've had an insight about the material. Um, that tends to happen to me during my yoga practice. Um, you know, Maureen Dowd wrote about this book back in October and kind of came out of the closet and announced that she does yoga, and she's found it's the only thing that helps her relax. I'm willing to bet that yoga also plays a major role in her creativity as a columnist. I mean, Maureen is out there day after day after day doing interesting stuff, provocative stuff, mm -hmm. extremely creative stuff. And you just, you know, you're right, there's a lot of, this is, tends to be a highly anecdotal area. There's been a few scientific studies that are suggestive, but it's not like massive amounts of evidence that yoga is a spur to creativity. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence. So. Mm -hmm. And in a way that gets back to the question about kind of the, 
the, the inner versus the outer side. I mean, do, do, do the ideas pop up when you're kind of inwardly focused? They pop, no, sometimes it's when you get distracted. I mean, uh, for me personally, it happens in all different kinds of ways, but it tends, they tend to bubble up, you know, in this process. I don't, that's a good question. I'm not sure I've identified exactly where in the arc it is, but sometimes, you know, you glance away, you lose focus, and bingo, jingo, something, something bubbles up. So, you know, I, in my own personal psychology, all I know is that in the course of a routine, it's often a, a fertile time for, um, for fresh ideas to bubble up. And I think part of that is quieting. Mm. You find that in yoga, if, you're, if it's done, I mean, there's this external, you know, fast-paced yoga with, like Bikram Studios, they have mirrors. The last thing they want to do is have you be internalized. They're all about competition. Bikram just held this sports yoga competition. Mm -hmm. um, they are into having you compare yourself to other people. So that's, you know, one of these new styles. But old style yoga that I learned is very internalized and you are concentrating on your body. The scientific studies suggest that when you do that, you are doing right brain activation. The right brain, which is associated with spatial awareness and creativity, emotion, a lot of stuff, is also connected with your proprioceptive mm -hmm. sense. You close your eyes and you can feel, oh yeah, my arm's out here, mm -hmm. you know, or I'm, oh, I'm pressing on my forehead. That's all related to uh, right brain stuff. And there is a lot of ev emerging evidence that yoga activates the right brain. So, you know, when, and partially, as the right brain activates, the left brain chatterbox quiets. Mm -hmm. So part of this creativity may be just slowing that left brain chatter a little bit to the point that some of the other deeper subconscious processing happens. I mean, who knows, right? This is all speculation of a science reporter uh, who's not a, uh, you know, psychology is not my beat. I tend to, unfortunately, I tend to be more into weapons of mass destruction and that kind of stuff. But, um, but it works for me. So I mean, the, the, it seems like there's something there. This part of it sounds very much like meditation, which I've done some of. Um, and, you know, the idea, at least in the, in the tradition that I've uh, practiced, is for starters to still your mind, to calm mm -hmm. your mind. It does mm -hmm. involve internal awareness. Through breathing, focusing on breathing and yep. and 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 focusing on sensations um, yep. throughout your body. Yeah, it's very. Uh, what is it? Uh, vipassana. Yeah, that's I, that's what I've done. Okay, well, it, this is to me, you know, yoga done right is a um, sort of flowing vipassana. You're using all those tricks and techniques and incorporating them in a wider physical re regimen. Mm -hmm. um, and the effects are quite powerful, as is this, you know, this focusing on your breathing and doing this Buddhist kind of uh, concentration on your body. And I think it's, you know, I think these are all kindred disciplines. Mm -hmm. They approach it in different ways, um, but the effects are similar. Does it, uh, d does that frame of mind give you more um, kind of detachment in the way you view your situation in the world? In other words, if, you, if you're doing yoga and you're very inwardly focused and your mind is calm and you start thinking about other people, maybe including people who like don't like you and stuff, are right. you able to, because this is one of the rewards of, of meditation I've found, right. does right. it allow you to step back uh, and, and look at your whole situation more impartially? I would say yes, but... Judging from the amount of of invective and the, the hate mail that I've received in response to the book, I mean, I'm now kind of reassessing like what yoga does. I mean, I've gotten I've gotten a lot of wild mail over the decades, as you might imagine, um, especially in dealing with weapons of mass destruction, mm -hmm. Iraq, Iran, nu nuclear proliferation, all kinds of stuff. I, I think of myself as having a fair amount of scar tissue. As a journalist, I can take it all. But some of these yogis, right, where the, all these sort of effects that you're describing, you'd think, you know, I can be more detached, and uh, they don't seem 
emotionally detached. They seem as infuriated, more infuriated than I think I've ever seen anybody, uh, you know, in, in emails. What, right? what are they upset about? They, I don't know. Be, I, a measure of my innocence and my naivete was thinking that this book would re be received as, oh, how interesting. This will help me sort of winnow and sift and figure out better how to you know, do my practice. Mm -hmm. The metaphor I use in the um, prologue is it's like informed consent. You're learning, you know, both the benefits and the risks, and gosh, this will really help me. These people react like, you know, that I've somehow attacked this notion of perfection. Also, I think there's an economic element. You know, people talk about the yoga industrial complex. Mm -hmm. There are bill billions and billions and billions of dollars at stake in selling people the idea that yoga is the one-stop shop for exercise, for everything. Mm -hmm. It's going to help you lose weight. The science strongly suggests that yoga lowers your metabolism. It's all the stuff you know from Vipassana. You know, you are relaxing. You are de-stressing. Yoga sh assuredly does that. Mm -hmm. But you go into the literature and you see one book and one yogi after another saying, yoga revs up your metabolism. It really gets you going. You'll burn more cows and automatically lose weight. Mm -hmm. Well, the people who are selling that to millions of consumers out there are frightened by science saying that's not true. It's an economic threat. So I think that's part of the, the negative reaction as well. So they're hating on you. I'm getting some pretty powerful hits. It's both, I think it goes from this wonderful idealism in a way where, you know, people are aiming for perfection and any, anybody saying that, well, just, you know, it, like any institution, it's got its ups and downs and you have to kind of pick and choose. Mm -hmm. It's like risk benefit, every aspect of life mm -hmm. in relationships and food and your job, you know, you want to, you pick a path, right? And you should do that in yoga. And they're saying, no, it's perfect all the way to the, you know, the people who are uh, selling all kinds of miracle cures. I mean, go on the web, mm -hmm. yoga will cure cancer. It's over and over and over. I mean, you see it there, and uh, a lot of this stuff is just off the charts. Mm -hmm. You know, I will say in defense of Vipassana meditation that when I've written about it, and you, and you get it from both sides, you know, you get the people who just resent people who go off on what they see as lavish meditation vacations and just right. have a, the, the negative stereotype about meditation. You get it. You get some stuff from them. And then you do get, invariably, some negative feedback from practitioners themselves. I will say, I think the negative feedback from practicer, practitioners of meditation has, by and large, been quite civil. Um, I, right. I'm, sh I'm shocked by the time. I mean, I'm told routinely, uh, you know, I can read you if you want to hear some of these I'd letters. I love some hate mail. Oh, I don't get it. It's like I don't get enough myself. Oh, know? geez, you know this. If this really made my day here when I got some of these. When it, the uh, the New York Times Magazine excerpt of the injuries chapter was mm -hmm. called "How Yoga Can Wreck Your Body," mm -hmm. or at least that was the headline on the web. So here was one, one you know one one bit of fan mail. You are a wreck. You do not know anything about yoga. Why did you write a book about something you obviously know nothing about? You are a jerk. Okay, that's one letter. I think I, he or she raises valid questions. Uh, absolutely. I tell you, you know, I've gotten very introspective, especially with this next one. Listen, moron, and moron is spelled M-O-R-A-N. <laughs> so I'm gonna, so, <laughs> so I'm gonna, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna add a little of um, imagined accent here. Listen, moron. I've been using yoga and karate for over 35 years, and it has improved everything in my life. Well, I totally agree. I've been using it for 42 years, and it's improved everything in my life. So we're on the same page there. So before you open your mouth, idiot, know what you are talking about. Is no spelled N-O? Yeah, uh, yeah, no. You got I mean, no right? But there, but, but there were some serious punctuation problems and other flaws in this letter, and it makes you... And, and then my favorite letter of all it was ending, basically, GFY. So, Wait a second. GF, this shows you how, like, out of it I am. GF, GF, you know, so these people... Oh, oh I get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah. They're wounded, and they are angry. 
and they are, I mean, I've had uh, hexes and curses put on me. I mean, there's black Tantra, uh, you know, right and left-handed Tantra, and oh my God, people are, uh, you know, the occult forces are getting ready to crush me. Obviously, I'm crushed. Obviously, I'm now deranged. I mean, the proof is in, in well, all around me. If you're a shadow so, of your former self. There it is. Um, wow. <laughs> well, okay, but still, there are some nice people who do yoga. You seem nice. There are met, most, everybody I've met, um, you know, the, the, you know, I'm starting to go out on the circuit and su doing signings and talks. And, you know, these, the hate mail is the exception. Mm -hmm. Most of the, the feedback I'm getting has been amazingly positive. It, the, the best comes from the most experienced people, studio owners, teachers, celebrity yogis, people who really know the inside story, and they say, thank you. Mm -hmm. This is starting a debate and a conversation that we've needed for a long time. And then I go to these signings, you know, and people come up, and they are so appreciative. I did a signing, um, and there was a yoga teacher waiting for me, you know. She had gotten in early, and we talked for an hour. We just had the greatest time. And there's a, it's quite gratifying as an author, uh, to get the positive feedback, there's a lot of it. And a lot of it is revelatory. I got a call, I got a, took a lot of heat for a New York Times article on yoga, sex, and gurus, right? We will, we will get to the subject of sex, believe me. Okay. Go ahead, yes. Okay, well, so yesterday I get a call out of the blue. Here I am writing about uh, Jim Cameron going down in a submersible in the, in the deep Pacific, right? And the call comes in from this woman who has studied everywhere, and she proceeds to rattle on about how, you know, how she was sexually taken for a ride by Swami Rama, a very um, kind of holy, notorious yogi who's no longer with us, um, but apparently was extraordinarily sexually active with a lot of women, and she was one of them, and she just, you know, wanted to unburden herself and tell me about what came down between her and Swami Rama. And it was fascinating. I mean, it's a, it's a picture of this particular run amok Swami that uh, many people don't appreciate. And uh, I touch on that stuff in the book. I, I look more at the science, right? You know, what's the, what's the science behind this kind of uh, crazy behavior? And it turns out there's, there's uh, a lot of suggestive stuff, but I don't know. I could write a little encyclopedia now, which I'm not going to do, about all this stuff and injuries. I didn't appreciate, for instance, how big the reform movement was. There are lots of people out there who are, you know, styles, individuals, schools, studios, who are working to make yoga safer. Hmm. They're very aware of the potential of injuries, and they are reinventing poses they are customizing things. You know, a lot of um, picture book yoga is having, you know, forcing people into picture-perfect postures rather than having the postures adapt themselves to individuals, right. all of whom are unique. You know, one of the big shocks for medical students when they sit there in anatomy and cut open the cadaver and go, oh, my gosh. The organs are they, they aren't where they you know are portrayed in the in the textbook. Mm -hmm. Well, that's true for all of us. You know, the the organs aren't in the right place, and our muscles are all a little different. And we have all these quirks and idiosyncrasies. And to try to impose these cookie cutter poses on our unique bodies uh, can oftentimes uh, result in problems. And what are the biggest kinds of problems that, that what are, what, what's the gravest kind of injury that, that can result from, uh, to, from, from can, an can, overly can I, rigid conception of standard I, practice? Do I have a second to go grab a prop here? We, we encourage props, yes. And while yeah. you're gone, I will juggle. Here, here's Bertha. <laughs> ah. Okay, Bertha, you know, has... Uh, you know, here's a former yoga student who had a bad problem, and I'll show you right here. Um, the this, I you know, I came at yoga as this sort of uh, you know stress management. It's really I'm a mediocre yogi, right? But 
what surprised me the most is are there are these big extremes, really good and really bad. Here's one of the worst. Um, this is the vertebral artery. Mm -hmm. Unlike any other place on the human body, this artery winds its way through a bony gauntlet. Now, is that right below your, that's in your neck right there? This or? is the head. Yeah. This is the neck. These, mm -hmm. This is C1, C2, C3, C4. These are the cervical vertebrae. Mm -hmm. And from C6 up to C1, this artery is winding its way through this bony labyrinth. I don't know if you can see that, but yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it's wild. There's no place on the human body like this. And it's right in the neck. The carotids, which go through the front here, mm -hmm. and you can feel them pumping away alongside your windpipe, it's a whole different deal. There's no bone around them. But there is right here. Mm -hmm. Well, in some yoga poses, like shoulder stand, which I don't do anymore because of what I discovered, plow position, which I don't get close to because of what I've discovered, you know, you are bending the these fragile little arteries around a lot. Mm -hmm. What happens is you tear you can tear the inner lining, then the lining starts to bulge with all kinds of blood cells and clots, and you can occlude the artery, or the clots can let go and go into your brain. Either way, you're going to have a stroke. That's brain damage. That's a very bad day of yoga practice. It can send you to the emergency room, or it can send you to the morgue. About ten percent excuse me, about one in, one in less, a little less than one in 20, um, about less, a little less than 5% of people who have these kinds of what they call arterial dissections die. So it's a serious, very serious injury. And to, to my eye, it goes way beyond the kind of like, oh, it's just a sports industry, you know, injury. I mean, yeah. everybody, everybody gets these things. So this is different. This is way serious and it's something that i talk about at some length because even though the risks are low mm -hmm. the consequences can be extraordinarily high and the, some of my uh, critics have said oh he only cites old literature this stuff doesn't happen anymore that's passe well a they don't understand how the scientific literature works which is just as prone to fashion as anything else if it's hot and new journal editors want it mm -hmm. if you know, after a while, they say, oh, well, we've heard about yoga strokes. What, what's new? They won't accept the articles. So it becomes a, a general topic in, in medicine. Right. But also, uh, you know, I can read you one of the letters if you want. The, uh, I've got a lot of letters on serious injuries, including strokes. A guy last year suffers a stroke, and he's still in therapy. He says his life is shattered emotionally and physically. He's trying to get it together. These strokes that go through because of the problems with the vertebral artery, yeah. go to the old brain, the rear brain, the hind brain, the cerebellum, which controls all your muscular coordination. Mm -hmm. So ironically, yoga priding, priding itself on this sort of you know, muscular perfection and being able to do these elaborate uh, physical things, it attacks that quality. You know, you can still think perfectly clearly because you're still getting uh, your forebrain and the prefrontal lobes of your brain are all fine. Mm -hmm. National thought is fine, but uh, in terms of sort of those more ancient functions, you can be in serious function. Your, the muscles in your face will start to droop. You get something called Horner's syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it looks terrible, and it's you know it's part, like Parkinson's. Like you can't, you know, I can't grab that coffee cup. Mm -hmm. So, so if I ask what's the worst thing that can happen from yoga, the answer is death. And if I ask what's the second worst, it sounds like serious stroke that permanently impairs your yeah. Not you. I mean, the, one of the cool things we we're learning in science is neuroplasticity. Right. Um, amazing stuff. So you, with the correct therapy, there's this wonderful book that came out of two or three years ago called, um, what is it? Uh, my, my insight. Oh, I'm forgetting the time. Blanking on the title now. But it's about this uh, neuroscientist who suffered a massive stroke and pieced herself back together. It's just a, a wonderful mm -hmm. tale of tri you know personal triumph over a medical disaster, mm -hmm. and it all goes to neuroplasticity. We can learn to rewire our, our brain and uh, you know regain skills that we thought we've lost after a stroke. Mm -hmm. But it's much better <laughs> not to. Yeah, not I to, just as soon uh, skip the whole. Yeah, me too. Thing. I don't do shoulder stand. I don't do plow anymore. It's too. Now, now uh, if you look at the lower part of that spine, you're holding. 
Yeah. Here's my question. You know, I, I think a lifetime, I mean, I, I, I started off with a handicap, which is that I'm tall and thin, handicap in terms of the likelihood of getting, developing back trouble. And then a lifetime of sitting in chairs with and giving no consideration to my posture. Everybody on this this model spine, they right. have a little built-in herniated disc here for you. And thank for you. That, like that, you. That would be mine. Yes, thank That's you. Right. It's right here. The uh, would I be much, would my back be in much better shape if I had been doing yoga? Well, I have an L4 L5 herniated disc, ah. and one of the and one of the ways I deal with it is with yoga. I mean, one of the first things I do in the morning is what they call the child pose, where you just kind of collapse down on the floor with your spine bent over, way over. Right. And the next thing I do is uh, upward-facing dog, which gives you just exactly the opposite maneuver. And I'll do that over and over. And I find that it loosens me up, mm -hmm. loosens up my spine. It's part of the, you know, the series of exercises that I do to cope. Um, but also there's... Um, I find that things like Pilates-like core strengthening, all that stuff is, is important for uh, producing muscular strength, which, which helps with back problems. But, you know, face it, we're doomed because of sitting at desks all day and chairs. It's bad. But a lifetime of yoga didn't prevent you from de – I mean, it didn't give you such good posture that you, you avoided back problems altogether. Right. And I don't – and I don't – the truth is I don't know how I got my L4, L5 hernia. Mm -hmm. I assume it was from running on pavement. But maybe uh, maybe yoga was a contributor. Mm -hmm. The science suggests that, um, and I talk about this in the book, that yoga fights spinal deterioration. You know, you can see here these, you know, the the discs between mm -hmm. every vertebra. Mm -hmm. Those form early in life, and they don't get a, after they form. They don't get uh, the regular fluid from blood vessels. That's why people, as they age, tend to shrink because. The fluid is going out of the discs. Mm -hmm. Well, one theory is that bending the spine back and forth produces more fluid flow, interstitial fluid, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe gr oh, growth factors that keep the discs in better shape. But the emerging science is that uh, yoga does fight spinal deterioration. You take two different populations, yogis and non-yogis, and they have fewer, oh, okay. uh, less of that desic desiccation less of the spinal deterioration. Okay, well, good. So it could help. Now, on to sex, Bill. No, Here, here's yeah, a, here's a sentence sex. from your book, uh -oh. The Science of Yoga. I, I disavow e most everything that's controversial. We well, can't disavow this sentence because you oh. wrote it. I, I proceeded to discover that modern yoga throbs with open sexuality ranging from the blatantly erotic and the bizarrely kinky to the deeply spiritual. Um, would you rather start with the deeply spiritual and move on to the bizarrely well, let's kinky, get, or start with the bizarrely kinky? Let's start with the bizarrely kinky. Okay. Get it? Get let's let's over let's and get done. that out of the way. Okay. I'm not going to give the name of the site, but there are fascinating videos that are posted that will show you what extreme flexibility can do for your sex life, for your autoerotic sex life, and you can use your imagination. Um, they are, the videos are amazing, and you see them once and you never want to see them again. Um, but, and they, and they, and those people making those videos will s sing the praises of yoga, and specifically a younger yoga. <laughs> Which, so, you know, I mean, that's, I, I had no idea. I, now that I know it, I don't really want to know it, but it's out there. And, so. and this is all, Autoerotic that we're talking auto, about. Auto. This is autoeroticism at, at at its at extremes that I never imagined were. So possible. this would allow you to stimulate yourself in ways that would not be possible if you weren't capable of, uh, of of if you weren't highly flexible. If you couldn't bring your mouth, for instance, down to your pelvic region, which most people can't do, I cannot. I'm proud to say, um, but there are some people who can, and mm -hmm. interesting things follow from it. And we wish them well, don't we? We wish them extreme well and have a good life. Uh huh. Okay. Now, suppose uh, your goal was not to uh, heighten your autoerotic sex life, but your mm -hmm. but but your sex life involving other human beings. Yeah, I th I, I think that is one of the, you know, there's so there's so much in this area. I devote a chapter of the book to it, but um, there are some people who suffer with what therapists call SAD, a, you know, sexual arousal disorder. Mm -hmm. They do not 
they cannot get aroused. They are just lumps, and they don't have the hormonal wherewithal to uh, be able to have satisfying heterosexual or homosexual or any kind of relationships. They just don't get horny. Mm -hmm. So for those people, a little bit of yoga may go a long way. I mean, the, the clinical evidence is real clear. Yoga stirs sexual hormones, and it can raise levels of arousal. So for those people, it may be a good thing. There's, but yoga also um, can work, you know, take if you have, let's say, a regular hormonal balance or are even, you know, kind of a hypersexual kind of person, and you start doing yoga, you know, you can get moved into crazy places. And I'm, I'm very proud of the book for sort of putting this on the table. If I can just uh, grab one, there's a wonderful post by a guy at the Chicago Tribune named Stephen Markley, he write, writes a blog called, or contributes to a blog called Red Eye. Mm -hmm. He was going on, it's, it's really a funny read, um, about how he started doing yoga, and he said he never, ever had a problem with his sex life, right? But then all of a sudden, he says, the problem is not that yoga is emasculating, but, it, but that it makes you want to hump lamp posts. <laughs> he talks about, you know, how he's like basically lit this fire in his body and he was freaking out, you know, and it was only when Maureen Dowd told him about the science of yoga that he kind of had this eureka, you know, you know, because he'd never been told this in yoga class. He'd never been informed that, you know, yoga is not only a good bracing tonic for all kinds of stuff, it stirs hormones and it can stir your sexual hormones. So, you know, the, the blog is sort of a, uh, a thank you to the book for for raising the issue. Well, and in fact, it, it yoga does raise testosterone levels, whereas some forms of exercise actually lower them. Is a ro uh, you know the kind of pounding, the the uh, standard uh, exercise physiology texts say that things like jogging will lower your uh, testosterone levels. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably because of stress. Those. Uh, kinds of hormones tend to be stress-related. Yoga is a de-stressor. So as it relaxes you and does that stuff, it uh, has this ability to lift things that are the opposite of stress. You know, you think of being in the mood. Well, it, when it's going right, the mood, at least at the beginning, is not very stressful. It's very relaxed. And that's what yoga does. And it turns out there's lots of physical evidence for that. Um, brain waves, hormone levels... At the University of British Columbia, uh, some interesting researchers looked at uh, fast breathing, which is often done in yoga classes. It's called Bastrika Pranayama, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Presto changeo, blood flow was increasing dramatically to the, gen the genitals of the people who they were studying, right? And they did all kinds of interesting controls. They did it over and over. They've published, I think, over the course of about six years, more than two very interesting papers. And, you know, the blood flow is increasing, just as certain yoga poses will do. The cobra, where you're, which is a very old yoga pose, where you're down, laying down prone, and you lift your head and your, your upper torso so all the weight is on your pelvis. Mm -hmm. Well, that also will increase circulation there and... Apparently, that's the reason that you know, the testosterone levels go up and you get this revitalization, this kind of stirring of your sexual side. So kind of regular yoga, even, even yoga that's not specifically directed toward this goal, and I think some yoga is directed toward the goal of enhancing your sex life, but regular yoga makes you more, uh, more amenable to, to, to sex and, heightens your, and can heighten your sexual arousal? Yes, level. but they're just like, you know, at the beginning of this conversation, there are many yogas. Some feature this, uh, some of the old tantric poses more than others. Right. There are poses that are hardly ever done today called like Agni Sara. I'm probably mispronouncing it. It's this wild abdominal Kind of I think soft. I think Agni means fire, fire. In, in the language and, of whatever in India. Ancient Sanskrit, Indian absolutely. It is, it's and fire you get mm -hmm. when you do this pose, or something called Nali Kriya, where you isolate um, abdominal muscles and create kind of like a butter churning effect through your abdomen. Well, you are stir stirring a lot of stuff when you do that. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the old tantric ones, but even the the kind of cleaned up. Hatha that uh, we all do today still has a lot of this 
residue of sexual arousal. And uh, interestingly, a yamgar in the light of on yoga, which is one of the classic yoga texts, at, at the end, you know, issues kind of a warning. It's very veiled and opaque. You have to kind of have the, you know, it's all coded in, in uh, you have to have the right lens to under get what he's talking about. But he's basically saying, watch out. You know, this can really stir the sexual fires. And if you're not careful, you'll spend your life in, uh, in you know, in sexual abandon and, and fall far off the path. Mm. That's sounds, good... sounds interesting. One of the pitfalls. One of the pitfalls, yeah. Watch out. So tantric yoga has been specifically geared toward toward sex life for from the beginning. Is that right? Well, yeah. I got a pile of hate mail on this. Tantra goes to, you know, we all have this monotheistic Christian Judeo framework, right? Well, the Hindus have this polytheistic framework, and a lot of it goes to this fundamental duality. And Tantra goes to this yin yang or male female shakti shiva duality mm -hmm. and it talks symbolically about oneness you know you unite the worldly dualities in yourself and you achieve enlightenment so a lot of tantra is nothing more than a meditation or a religion or aspiring to this oneness however there's heaps of scholarly and you know wonderful visual evidence um, the, I could show you, I can't, the, um, Hajuraho temples in, that were raised in medieval India, you know, it's just, um, it's, it's, well, you know what I can show you? We're on TV, right? I, I hope so. If all is going is this, well. Is, yeah. is porn okay here? Porn Here's is medieval. encouraged. Porn is encouraged. Here's mm -hmm. medieval, uh, medieval porn. Here we have That's a really hit. Right early headstand here with uh, mold. Can you see that okay? Well, it happens to be right behind the, uh, the my, my face, which is superimposed on your face. So if you raise it, I will be able to see it better, but I think other people can already see it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I got it. I mean, you know, this is an early headstand, folks. You know, now this, you know, people would say, well, this is all about symbolic union, and oh yeah, it is. <laughs> but um, <laughs> then you get things, this is also from the side of the temple. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's a more symbolic union, yeah. This is a very symbolic union. Yeah. And uh, they're right. I mean, a lot of this is talking about duality and let's study this and let's get beyond it. But, whoa, they also had, there's whole books, uh, the Yanni Tantra, which goes into a lot of detail about having intercourse and the right kind of people to have intercourse with and when and how and try to extend the length of this bliss so that you can reach these higher spiritual states. Um, you know, I, people don't like it. There was a whole laundering effort in the early 20th century to try to mm. remove the tantric asso associations from yoga. I mean, as I spell out in the first chapter of the book, that was done mainly for, out of nationalistic interests. Mm -hmm. There was a concerted effort to throw off the, the uh, British rule, and, one of, and lots of indigenous arts got cleaned up and moved forward as part of that agenda. Yoga was one of them. Mm -hmm. All the unseemly stuff, the tantra, the sex. No, 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 no. We're going to focus on health and fitness. Mm -hmm. And it worked. It became health and fitness, and it caught fire and spread around the world. But it still has a lot of these intrinsic physical associations, uh, which can surprise people. Yeah. When I was in college, uh, there was a hockey player a guy who was like, you know, very athletic, good looking guy. And he said he was studying tantric yoga and he had never struck me as especially spiritual. And it turned out he was totally just working on his, his sexual endurance and, and, and his, you know, his ability to, to gratify people, which is a, a fine thing. But, but it sounds like there are people within yoga who are opposed to that kind of instrumental use of the tradition. Well, they are opposed to any kind of association other than this clean, you know, perfect road to, you know, the, the high spiritual life. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that, you know, there, there are a lot of benefits to candor, one of which is, you know, it's kind of like the, the scandals we've lived through with the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Was it a wise thing to just sweep the philandering 
priests under the rug and hope for the best? Probably not. I think that resulted in a lot of new victims. Um, and you see over and over and over, people don't like this, but it's true, you know, gurus on a rampage. And a lot of times they are, it's a bittersweet story because they're in their 60s and their 70s and they're going strong. And you want to say, yeah, go, go, go. I mean, why not? This is part of life. Why not have sex with a lot of young students, you mean? No, why not have a, you know, uh, to be a sexually alive person in your 70s, mm -hmm. right? It's a birthright, maybe, or something. Um, you know, it's a possibility that's there. And uh, the problem is this power imbalance that you get with authority figures, mm -hmm. psychiatrists, medical doctors, congressmen, God knows, right? But with yoga, you're also fanning these physiological fires and... Um, I, I, I don't want to bad mouth gurus and swamis. I've met some of these people. They are incredibly high, wonderful, compassionate, spiritual people. Mm -hmm. But as in any profession, there are some rotten apples. And the evidence is they can be very rotten. Swami Ramagai was a serial philanderer. So at least one of his victims was a, a minor and a Pennsylvania jury found in her favor. And there were punitive damages. I mean, it, it's some of the stories are unbelievable. Mm -hmm. uh, and a little, I don't think uh, some light uh, can do any wrong in those kind of situations. Right, right. And of course, that's a separate matter from people wanting to use yoga to enhance their own sex lives within Yes, absolutely. Or, you know, if they've got a low libido, raise it up. Or, you know, there's also things you can do to, to, to cool the fires. I mean, that's, one of, to me, one of the great discoveries as a science reporter is everybody knows yoga increases your physical flexibility. I mean, that's what it's all about, right? I don't think most people understand, and I think science is a window into this, into how much it increases your inner flexibility. It can do all kinds of custom things. And this is where in the uh, epilogue of the, in the book I go, I wax sort of like, let's, let's move forward a couple centuries and look. You know, I can see yoga doctors in the future, people who really take this natural path to using that inner flexibility for all kinds of, you know, smart, preventive um, medicine and uh, health regimens. I mean, you can do a lot. This one guy I profiled in the book, Lauren Fishman, who is a, a, a wonderful physician in Manhattan who uses yoga. Um, he has cured, I think, something on the order of a thousand people uh, of ro rotator cuff problems. Mm -hmm. You know, just by using a smart modified headstand hmm. and uh, no surgery. Presto changeo, they're, they're doing it again. They can raise their shoulders. They can do all this stuff. It boils down to muscle substitution. But it's a simple, natural approach. Why spend all that money on surgery and recovery uh, if you can do it yourself? Mm -hmm. there's, 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 there's a lot of interesting stuff that I think can, uh, that yoga can do in the future. Okay. Well, maybe that's a good place to uh, leave it. Um, so, uh, thanks so much. Yeah. No, no, no. Thank you for your interest. I love it. Great book. Great looking book. Yeah. Cool, cool yeah, tactile can... effect again. No it's scratch a... and sniff, but it, no. does, it does look pretty nice. Nice looking book. It's doing very well, getting you a certain amount of hate mail as well as love mail. And that's, and, and balance after all is what yoga is all about, right? Amen, you know, brother. So that's a good thing. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you so much, Bill. It's been a pleasure. Same here. Take care.